Chance Technology, the podcast. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode. Today, next to me, we have Yeon Yu Ho. Hi. I asked her to join me to explain what ontologists do. At Gen's Technology, the ontology team, it is conformed for 40 people at the moment and growing from all nationalities and together they speak more than 40 languages. Yeon Yu not only is part of this team, but also has a technical background. She studied multilingual text analysis computational linguistics at the University of Zurich and also worked as a terminologist. Anytime I have to understand something, I ask her. When was the first time that you heard about ontologies? The first time I heard about ontologies was when I took semantic analysis course during my studies in computational linguistics. It was mandatory for us to read speech and language processing by Dan Jurefsky and James Martin. And in chapter 15, I came across with the term ontology for the first time. There I learned that the set of categories or concept is called terminology. And ontology represents a hierarchical organization that shows the relations among these concepts. So was it so remarkable that you even remember the chapter in the book? Well, I had to write a summary of the chapter for the assignment, and that's why I remember probably. How would you explain what is an ontologist? In simplest words, we are like librarians, and our ontology database can be a huge library. A library provides users with access to books, and a librarian helps users to find books of their interest. We ontologists guide our users through the ontology database with HR data. Every book has a classification code in order to be sorted and organized properly, which can also apply to our ontology work. We constantly work on various occupation concepts that are needed to be classified, and we try to organize them according to our ontology rules. I love the example. Thanks. And we are also teachers for artificial intelligence because we are selecting relevant contents and information for ontology and parser to improve the accuracy and quality of matching. From where do you obtain these occupation concepts? Good question. From job ads and CV from everywhere, and also imported or mapped databases and official collections of data and taxonomy. So when you find a new concept that is not in the database, what would be the procedure then? So first, we find these concepts classified as categorized, not categorized, or no categorized. Then the first thing we can check is if the concept can be merged within an existing one. If not, we have to consider how specific or generic the concept is to classify it precisely. We check the concept similarity as well. How do you contribute to our GENS ontology? Ontologies can provide semantic modeling that can detect the underlying meanings, and similarities in CV, resumes, and job descriptions. In order to achieve these purposes and goals, I contribute by creating the right structure among concepts and subconcepts, quality management, and consistent management of the multilingual ontology or knowledge representation database. How would a day of an ontologist creator look like? Very exciting. My daily task mainly composed of selecting concepts based on ESCO 08 codes, organizing the child terms related to those specific concepts and ensuring that they are in right hierarchical relations. The most important task is to check if the terms are correct in corresponding languages, including German, English, and languages which you are in charge of, in my case, Japanese and Korean. For those that are not so familiar with the term ESCO 08, Let me clarify that ISCO is the International Standard Classification of Occupation that the International Labor Organization created. So these codes that Yeon Yu was referring are to classify occupations. Exactly. But Yeon Yu, are the concepts you are working on only about occupations? No, they are composed of various branches, including, for example, skill, specialization, education, authorization, and industry. For skill, we make a distinction between hard skills, which are job-related knowledge and ability that employees need to perform their job duties, and soft skills, which can describe personal qualities that help employees thrive in the workplace. Education branch represents a set of concepts that are based on the field of study, qualification, degree, certificate, vocation, or online course and trainings. 
Since the arrival of the current pandemic, more and more online courses and trainings have been released on different platforms such as Coursera, Udemy, and LinkedIn, which triggered a significant digital transformation in the education field. Yeah, I think we we all have seen more and more of those courses like being advertised. Yes. Yes. Um, When parsing, we annotate these kinds of courses, for example, clinical natural language processing, Python for data analysis and visualization, digital marketing or online SAP trainings. Labeling and correlating these courses and trainings to specific occupations help us create a better overview of potential matching results. We also check and added education level and experience level concepts related to occupation. Then when we work in parsing, we annotate data in order to recognize and identify specific types of entities from job descriptions and resumes, CVs, in order to create gold standard data for AI systems. Okay, for those who are not that much into the technical world, what is exactly the gold standard? In NLP, natural language processing and computational linguistics, gold standard refers to a set of data that has been manually prepared or labeled, which can represent desired results as closely as possible. This can be background knowledge to teach and train AI systems about the basic concept of occupation, geographical objects, people, companies, or experiences with machine learning algorithms. Uh huh. So we are coming back to teaching the artificial intelligence applications to create intelligent results. Yes, our mission is to give them plenty of quality data because false tags and annotation can lead to false and inaccurate identification of entities. We want to avoid that. If we want AI applications to perform like humans, we need to be excellent annotators and teachers to create real human-like intelligence results. Of course. And what kind of challenges do you face? We are dealing with a multilingual database, so we face many challenges from consistency issues to ambiguity problems. Um, We have to check if all terms in all languages are semantically consistent. Do you have an example in mind that could help us to understand it? So, for example, we have an occupation concept called Geisha. Do you know it? Uh, yeah, I think you mean the this Japanese woman from the book and movie Memories of a Geisha. Exactly, that was a good memory. The Japanese performance artists and entertainers that are trained in the traditional Japanese performing art styles. So I had to work on this concept. Yeah. And in our database, we have different hierarchical trees. So first I put this geisha concept under the performer and entertainer tree, but then I realized we also have a specific tree for dancers. And geishas do many things such as dance, music, and singing, as well as being proficient conversationalists and hosts. So in this specific case, I had to classify under both trees. I see. So it is really important to understand every single concept. Yes. Because we always have to consider which concept can belong under each tree. Therefore, it's very challenging, but very interesting. (laughs) I see. And what do you like about this job? Well, I can apply my computational linguistic knowledge. And you can actually apply computational linguistic knowledge to various fields. But the fact we're dealing with HR data is very fascinating. We can also capture the newest trends from HR market while parsing CV resumes and job descriptions. Before joining this company, I wasn't aware that such a tremendous amount of occupation exists in the world. What makes my job more interesting is that we integrate country or culture specific occupation concepts into our database, such as Wagashi Shokunin from Japan, which is traditional Japanese confectionery craftsman, or Henya from Korea, which refers to female shellfish divers originated from the Korean province of Jeju. Also, when it comes to resume parsing and job description parsing, frequently it is quite challenging to parse because they are becoming more and more creative. Oh, what do you mean when you say creative? Um, For example, recently I was parsing a job ad about firefighters and they were asking if the applicant had seen the anime series called Gundam, which is a Japanese military fiction with robots. It was sort of a preferable requirement in the job ad. Okay, I see. So maybe the head of the firefighter was a big fan, but uh, still... 
Yes, it's um, very creative, no? I was thinking, how do you put such a thing in a job description, right? Yeah, I don't think I would have written that on a job ad. Uh, and, and what did you do? Well, in that case, that was not a skill or anything that could be a condition to be a firefighter. So uh, what we do is to annotate that as not relevant skill. As you can see, working with job ads on a daily basis can be sometimes surprisingly funny and interesting. But at the same time, it makes it very complicated. Why? Well, think about the huge amount of not relevant requirements that are written in the job ads. For us humans can be quite confusing to read. Um, watching an enemy series to be a firefighter is a requirement. We know it cannot be a skill, but a machine cannot distinguish that. I see your point. Um, I remember this paper of the International Labor Organization about the feasibility of using big data in anticipating and matching skills needs, uh, which I will leave the link in the description of this podcast. And if we think of parsing job ads on a larger scale, the more jobs we give to the machine, the more probabilities of finding such not relevant information and therefore the confusion and wrong results. Exactly, Laura. This is why it is so important to explore the data set in detail because of the enormous variance in information density and relevance across vacancy postings. So you carefully annotate the not relevant information and like this, with enough annotations, the machine improves the extraction of such entities. Am I right? Yes, and think that this not only works for relevant or not relevant information, we also help recognize other information about the job advertised that frequently is implicit, hidden in stipulations about education, trainings, and qualification, and about the experience. If these are not represented accurately, semantically, and in a knowledge representation, the collected data is distorted. Thank you, Yonyu, for joining us today. I think now, thanks to you, we have a better understanding of why it will be mainly experts and not algorithms who will continue to be responsible for such data modeling in the future. Anytime. It was such a great pleasure. In the next episode, we will talk about the big world of translation and its challenges on big data and HR technology. Subscribe if you don't want to miss it. Thank you for listening and goodbye. This was a Chance Technology Podcast. Listen to new chapters every month.